Gia Gamboa is an empowered coach, civic worker, and corporate trainer. Whether she is helping others, working on her craft, or on the go, she gives everything, she does her all, and that is what makes her the inspiring individual that she is today. Hi guys, and welcome to another episode of In Love With Me, where we feature inspiring individuals who will share their amazing stories. Um, for this series, our topic is finding your why. I am your host, Mafe Yunan Velasco, and I just wanna say thank you to everyone who's supported us. This is the third season, and it's just such a blessing to have all the support and all the messages and all the guests that have been on our show. So without further ado, guys, I have such an amazing guest today. She is an empowered woman, a civic worker, an empowerment coach, and a corporate trainer to motivate us to take action. So let me welcome the beautiful and amazing Ria Gamboa. Hello, Ria. Hi, hi, Mafe. Hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Finally, I get you on here. Thank you for saying. I know. Thank you. And um, for sharing your inspiring journey and to empower and inspire everyone. But before I ask you what you've been up to lately, Ria, can you please share with everyone so they, they can get to know you a little bit more on how you are the empowered and inspiring woman that you are today? Uh, so basically, right now, I'm focused on a couple of things. So for one thing, I uh, founded a nonprofit organization called Empower Philippines. So what we do is we provide compassionate education for the Filipino people to basically eradicate um, uh, gender-based violence and gender inequality. Um, I also work for a mental health tech company that provides preventative care, uh, care therapy for uh, corporations and all their employees. So those two things are pretty much my biggest focus right now. And I'm sure that you've had such an um, amazing journey of your life up until now. And to be able to even think about um, giving back to others. Because I know, uh, you know, being a life coach, being someone who is the stronger individual mm -hmm. on mentoring others, it, it does take a lot of courage, a lot of patience, a lot of training mm -hmm. to ensure that you're okay, right? So yeah. I just want to ask, uh, I know we met back in the fashion world, because you do have a- More than a decade ago. <laughs> <laughs> but you have a new talent that, that, you know, I also appreciate because you made me um, I guess look well in front of the camera and things like that. So do you want to go back there and talk about um, perhaps how you started in the fashion industry first? Okay, well, in the fashion industry, to be honest with you, um, very early on in my life and the way I was brought up, I was just never challenged. I was never allowed to, I would say, um, think outside the box. And because of that, I never really actualized any of my skills, any of my true gifts. I never really knew what my skill set was because, you know, I was going for the bare minimum my whole life, let's put it that way. And um, getting into the fashion industry started because I was actually a writer and since uh, probably since I was a kid and then a sports writer in college and then I applied for a job as an editorial assistant in a big publication here in the Philippines and then from there I realized hey these makeup artists earn a lot more without having to do much that's all they do and they earn so much so uh, to be honest all respect and if I didn't have that um, bare minimum mentality when I was younger, I probably would have excelled up until now, probably still doing makeup and billboards. But because I never applied myself, even in that craft, uh, my ability to excel also never materialized. So that career kind of dwindled down sometime in 2010 or even probably earlier, I was just in denial that it was dwindling down. Uh, but yeah, uh, my, my makeup became the option for me because I was a lazy person. That's the truth. That's just the honest truth. Uh, I didn't want to have to to do work and then um, then I ended up really finding and learning more about myself sometime after 2010 or sometime during 2010 and then with finding yourself now you are that strong individual you are that strong woman that empowers others so Still trying. 
<laughs> I was there still a couple of years from the fashion um, wow. industry. You started or wanting to get into mentoring others or even being a trainer wow. in your corporate um, yeah, very interesting. So the my journey basically towards inner work or transformative learning, um, it started around 2010. Uh, I took a personal development program. So basically it's personal development, human empowerment. And I got into it because of actually, this is a funny story, but it's actually an ex-boyfriend who got me into the program because he said that, you know, I, I want you to take a look at this. Um, I know that this person, my, my um, former partner was, somebody I really admired as a person. So I'm like, what is this person on? So when I took the program and very usually resistant towards any of those things, I don't like to be confronted. Um, but when I took the program, it shifted everything for me. So I started to navigate how I, how I processed my upbringing. I didn't even know I had an issue with it until I really got to, I guess, deconstruct everything, um, practice introspection and really be in conversation with uh, other inspiring people who allowed me to kind of see um, my potential. And that was the beginning of the journey. Um, I got into that type of transformative work because I took courses upon courses for personal development. I think I took about five or six courses within a span of two years. And then when I got so much from the program, I decided, and also being equipped, because I took a coaching program, um, I got equipped with um, tools to be able to probably help other people navigate this as well. So I want them to experience the same gift that I got at 2010. And that's basically what got me curious. And then it just piled on top of that from there. And what's the most rewarding part of that job? Because I know that you said mm. when it was the fashion industry, it was more mm. out of necessity or just mm. wanting to try. With this mm. one, I see you're really passionate about what you're doing. And why is it? And I would say that even if I chose makeup out of convenience, maybe there was something innate in me that wanted to give others an opportunity to see the best version of themselves. And whether I was doing that for makeup, maybe we all know beauty is on the outside, but sometimes you can't allow your inner personality to shine when you're not confident on the outside. So in a way, it still has to do with, um, I guess, personal development or or be bringing out the best version of yourself. And I wanted to um, sort of make that kind of contribution. That's why I was behind the scenes doing makeup on models, right? Uh, but I got clear on my whys, I guess given that our topic today is knowing your whys um i became clearer the more i got to know myself that that level of contribution that i wanted to achieve was actually innate in me it's just that i didn't know that yet so i was getting lost navigating um how to get to my goal because i wasn't fully conscious of what my why was at that time so it took years um Sure, I took the programs in 2010 to 2012, but even until today, that's why I refuse to be called a life coach. I'm, st I'm, st I'm not an expert on life, just to be clear. I'm still navigating my own journey, and I, I still pretty much believe that there is so much room to grow and, I guess, discover about yourself as you go along. Mm -hmm. That's so true. I mean, I think for us, um, you know, looking back, 10 years, 20 years, but like, dang, I should have done this earlier, or I should have done it this way, right? And I know we had this conversation because uh, you also mentor the youth. And yes. having said that, what is your biggest advice to young people to say, knowing what you know now? I mean, the well, basically my mentoring centers on trauma coaching for abuse survivors. That's what I do for the uh, nonprofit that I started with a friend of mine. But if I were to give an advice to the youth, um, I would say don't panic. Uh, stop thinking that you have a timeline for everything because I'm currently 38 years old. I'm still living my life fully. Um, my life is nowhere where I imagined it would be when I was younger. Like I thought at this point I'd be married, I'd have a family and all these things. And if I had learned earlier in my age that this would be um, on the shallow surface, the situation of my life, I would be really, but that, you're so old already. Why, why are you not there yet? But I can say right now that there's, that there's really no reason to panic because if yeah. you have a growth mindset, then you can just keep um, elevating and elevating 
without really putting any rules of, of where you should be comparing yourself. So yeah, just don't panic and always have a growth mindset. Be open to that. Really key. Yeah, it's totally really key right, key right now because I feel as though um, I, I just had this conversation with another friend of mine is that um, we tend to compare or we tend to get overwhelmed when we see other people do certain things on social media mm -hmm. or you know, um, your own family and friends who are succeeding in life. Mm -hmm. So you think, but really it's at your own pace. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what they're doing, right? And this mm -hmm. is what you're doing. So as long as you have the right mentorship, like what Rhea is doing, uh, you know, she's sharing and, and mentoring people to be better versions of themselves. Mm -hmm. At the same time, she's also still navigating her way to, yeah. to finding the the Rhea, the perfect Rhea. But yeah, I, I guess it's, there's no such thing as perfect. It's just yeah. being happy. I, I think uh, Rhea can attest to this is uh, fulfilling your happiness, your own uh, little goals that lead up mm -hmm. to that big rewarding yeah. right and so you know with that i know when we mentor others we have to stay on top of our game yes uh, we have to stay strong but again we're also human we're also women so we have our goals right ria mm -hmm. so what do you do when you're about to i guess mentor someone but you're not really having a great day yourself oh. how do you how do you motivate yourself this is a great question. I know that I, I actually shared something with you. Um, I have this tendency that even if I, I, I've stopped being a people pleaser at some point in my 30s, so that's not even really the concern, but I was in such fear of disappointment. Um, I got to understand that why I'm doing this and why it matters to me on a very deep level is because I want to make a contribution. So if I feel that I'm not able to contribute to somebody, it kind of brings me down and brings my energy down. And I don't know if you're familiar with the term empaths. I mean, I used to think that that was BS. I, I thought that yeah, I'm empathic. I know it as, as a description for somebody, but there have been a lot of studies and articles, scientifically speaking, about um, actual people who have a gift to absorb other people's feelings. And I started to understand that at some point, the more, um, especially considering that my work centers around trauma coaching and I speak to a lot of abuse survivors, I, I had a tendency to feel down and kind of it really brings my energy down when I speak to these kinds of people and of course on top of that my own um, you know personal everybody has their personal things going on so what I decided to do was I sought, sought the help of actually other coaches um, I read I don't go to actual um, formal sessions but I have four friends who I consider to I look up to so it, one would be uh, also an empowerment coach. One is, this is funny because I'm not religious, but she's a Christian pastor. Um, one is a faith healer, spiritual guide who, who practices Buddhism. And one is actually a psychologist. So actually, she's a psychiatrist. So I seek the opinion of these friends and engage with them in just real conversations. It's not even therapy sessions. Or I could go for therapy. It doesn't matter. You don't need to have a problem or mental health problem to seek that type of um, engagement with um, somebody considered to be a mentor, right? So I always expose myself to those kinds of people and that refreshes me. It allows me to combine different, um, uh, I would say different modalities and different approaches, but the common factor and what they all told me was, Ria, if this is exhausting for you, you can always say no. And I used to have a big problem saying no, um, because I don't want to disappoint people. If I feel I could offer some help, I'll go out of my way, even if it's taking a toll on me. And um, I learned in the last, and I'm still struggling with it, but I've learned in the last couple of years that um, you don't want to also spread yourself too thin and say yes to everybody and then not be able to give the right level of contribution that you wish for them. So it's okay to actually say no if it's too much. Last week, um, somebody wanted to do a coaching session and emotionally, I was just not okay because of the whole pandemic and what's been going on right now. I was feeling all kinds of anxiety for the future. So I actually had the courage to finally tell that friend that um, I'm sorry, but to be honest with you, I won't be able to give a good coaching session when I myself, um, I'm not feeling great. So she still told me 
if you want, still come to my place. Let's just um, have a good dinner, drink a bit of wine, and you don't have to coach. Um, actually, I'm coaching the mom from her trauma. So, yeah, I spent the evening at their place, and we all just, you know, had a great time without having any pressure. I realized I was the only one pre putting pressure on myself. Right. I realized that when I say no, they don't have a problem with it. It's just me. I created that. So I've learned to now um, be more, I would say, conscious be more mindful about those kinds of things yeah i feel as though god is talking to you to share that to me <laughs> I feel as though sometimes i am spreading myself too thin um i'm just glad and happy that you know the support group that we surround ourselves with mm -hmm. support us and like yeah. you said it's okay it's it's really okay to just um share with people that yes right today or right now i'm not um in a good place so mm -hmm. you know uh, i just need this space um, yeah exactly you know, I, a lot of people need to hear that most especially now you know i know people are feeling the same thing that you're feeling mm -hmm. but keep it on a positive light ria um mm -hmm. have you learned anything new about yourself during this uh challenging times or just this stay at home oh, gosh um, um, well for one thing i always thought that I could not, um, you know, I'm, I'm a very social being, but I also know that I am what they call an introverted extrovert, where I love people's energy, but it's like, I almost have a two hour threshold for social interactions. After that, I'm drained, I'm tired. I just want to be away from everybody and not talk to everybody. So in a way, the first couple of months of the quarantine was, well, actually the first month in itself was absolutely great for me because um, I learned to just be with myself and not have to always look at what is going on and worry about what's going on in the outside world. I got my own, I got my own, um, uh, I guess, resting period and uh, time for myself to really do my meditation and all of those things. But then on the second month, I started craving that social interaction, you know, wanting to see people. And we were still on very strict lockdown at that point. Um, and then on the third month, that is when I learned finally to be comfortable in front of the camera. I learned that I'm actually okay with video calls now <laughs> because before, whenever somebody would ask me for a phone call and there's videos, I'm, I'm very self-conscious. I know people probably have a hard time um, uh, imagining that because I am comfortable speaking with people, but I am I really hate cameras and I hate pictures and I hate videos. And I learned, um, my excuse before was, oh, it's very disengaging. When there's a screen in the middle, it's very disengaged. I don't feel that it's authentic. But then uh, th this pandemic has forced us to really yeah. strengthen our relationships, strengthen our um, connection with people, even if you're separated by a screen. And, and I believe that there's value in that. Um, I, I believe that there's value in realizing that our thoughts and our ideas of what works and doesn't work only happens in our head. So now I can definitely be more productive. I'm still very much connected with my high school friends, even if let's say we don't see each other at all, zero, zero physical interaction, but um, it's kept my relationships, I, I guess, in tip top shape now that I've learned to adjust because of this COVID thing. Well, I congratulate you and <laughs> I'm grateful for you to be okay because you're mm -hmm. part of this uh, campaign of ours. Uh, you know, spreading mental health and, you know, just mm -hmm. putting the wall down and sharing your story, Ria. It's amazing because I wanted other people to learn from you, you know, that uh, not, not to be afraid. I mean, especially right now, I think we're forced to do a lot of things that we don't want to, right? Mm -hmm. um, we just have to see the positive side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Like that, Ria was sharing that she did not like being in front of a camera or pictures mm -hmm. and things like that, but she's here yeah, now. Yeah, look. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> her amazing story, sharing her words of wisdom and, you know, finding her why you basically asked her that. I guess, you know, the other thing that I I want to, to learn about you, okay, so put me into like, um, you know, in your perspective, how do you, uh, I guess, set your mind to prepare for mm -hmm. a session with someone? Is there a, a habit you go to, a ritual that you prepare yourself? Mm. Share with us. 
Uh, basically, I used to not have a structure just because I always wanted people to feel that they're just having a conversation with somebody. That's why I don't call myself a life coach. I don't call myself a psychologist. And, and I'm not licensed. I do I do have a degree in psychology, but I'm not licensed. So um, I used to think that not having a structure worked perfectly so that it doesn't intimidate the other person. But I learned that for you to make a very clear contribution and know exactly where you're taking them you have to have these steps and goals in each conversation that you have so i guess to prepare myself i start to of course um uh, uh understand their background whether it's something they've shared through text or or whoever connected us with each other to actually have the background um of the person and then um when i when i run myself through the steps i don't um cling on too strictly on the steps during the session because I want the conversation to flow very naturally and for them to have the platform to really just share what they want to share, especially on the first session. Um, after that, I do a debriefing with them and also possibly whoever family or friend referred me to them so that I could um, give them some clues on how to better support the person that they got help for. Of course, not discussing any details because um, of co confidentiality, but it's basically, um, providing a strong enough support system around the person who did the coaching with me. So uh, I guess the debriefing would be very important. Um, but to answer your question, preparation, um, yes, I do have my clear structures of my goals and where I want to take the conversation. But during, during the actual coaching, um, I let it flow. I let it flow naturally and just look back if there are any details that I'm missing based on my structure. Amazing, Ria. It's it's like the journey that you have been on. I mean, for us to enjoy our bonding sessions during the fashion days, the, mm -hmm. the modeling days up to now, it's yeah. like, wow, what happened to us? We grew up. Life, life, <laughs> life happened. <laughs> I love the fact that, um, you know, we're all inspiring together. We're all growing together. You know, mm -hmm. all my friends and family who I have uh, the privilege of connecting through this platform, including yourself, is just, you know, it's mind blowing because, you know, I've always admired everyone. I always admired your talent. I always admire like the, oh, the designers, the other models, the, you know, the directors. And just to see us all um, reach this level. And also, especially at this time, it's so timely to have the position that you're in, the position that, um, you know, that we have here. Um, be able to inspire others and you know you never know who we're reaching out to or who's listening and i'm very grateful for that ria so can you share with everyone where they can find you do you have a website or maybe your socials or email um, I don't have a website. Um, I'm very much just learning this whole uh, art of self-promotion. Um, yes, I do speak a lot about my own advocacies by sharing articles or posting status messages, but I really just have my own social media account. Um, that's Ria Gamboa, although, of course, that's exclusive to my, my personal friends, but they can still message me on there. And also um, on my Instagram, this is funny, uh, fat, uh, fat, gal Riri, uh, fat girl Riri is my... That for the PH, basically. That's my Instagram handle, and that's public for people. So if they do want to reach out, they can they can do that. Yes, guys. You know, if I were you, I would suggest you guys reach out to Ria, even if you just want that boost of uh, happy hormones. You know, ask mm -hmm. her any questions if you have further questions or even advice that she can, you know, um, share with you. And maybe you can even book your sessions with her. Cause for me, I've known Ria for years and this woman is very inspiring. You know, her journey um, and her aura will, will, oh, will only uh, hear the real deal, you know? And that's what I admire about you, Ria, our friendship all these years is that you've always kept it real. You've never, you know, um, you've never shown me any anything that uh, wouldn't, uh, let my trust for you down, and mm -hmm. and I appreciate you. Um, I'm grateful Thank for you, you for likewise. people right now. Um, you know, especially at this time, I think you know, there are more things that you can share, or more um, advices. So um, maybe before we wrap up, can you share words of wisdom? You know, words of wisdom to the youth or anyone who is um, experiencing trauma. Um, mm -hmm. How can they stay faithful? Or hopeful, okay. 
that there are still opportunities after all this is said and done. I mean, rather than um, trying to give words of wisdom, maybe I could end with sharing a little bit of what I hope to achieve and hope that people actually band together with us, right? So um, like I did mention about my nonprofit, uh, people have an impression that it is a, because it's protection from gender-based violence and we're promoting gender equality. People have this impression that it's a women's NGO or a women's uh, nonprofit because I guess the most disenfranchised would be women and children because they're were physically more vulnerable but in reality i've noticed that this this cannot be a men versus women thing and while more women may be may feel or generally people think that women are more victimized when it comes to this everybody has played a role and we can all take accountability for certain things um for example trying to disrupt any kind of um, um, social, social cultural mentality that um, unknowingly enables uh, predators, I would say. So what we do is provide, um, like I said, compassion education. So we give gender sensitivity trainings, we do um, uh, deconstructing of uh, abuse culture. Um, we also, this is one thing I also want to, um, I think it's very important for people to know this. I'm hoping to start if, I don't know if you heard of the um, barbershop movement or she's not your rehab movement in New Zealand where men would actually convene together in a barbershop and just have real conversations about their feelings. Because at the end of the day, um, social cultural mentality, especially here in the Philippines, is so women should be Maria Clara, very conservative, purity culture, and then men should be macho and all of those. And I don't know if you guys are aware, but in the Philippines, the rate of suicide among men are 4.2 per 100K or 100,000 population, whereas women, it's only two out of 100,000 uh, population. So it shows you that if we are trying to create gender equality, we're trying to create protection from gender-based violence, we have to go deeper and really um, address the fact that men are also not given the safe space or the proper support system to be able to have real conversations with other men because it's gonna be perceived as weak and all of those things. So. These are the things that we want to educate people about. And if any of you guys um, feel that whether your organization or uh, your group, your, even your barcada could use this type of conversation, please feel free to reach out to us. I, I, I guess the biggest word of advice that I wanna leave you guys with is understanding that everybody goes through their own journey. We all react according to how the world occurs to us. So not to give any excuse for bad behavior, but if we are mindful enough and we elevate our consciousness, then maybe we can have an avenue to possibly alter our behavior as long as we're open, as long as we're seeking help and we don't see it as a bad thing if we start to detect that we aren't becoming the person that we wanna be. So yeah, that would be, I guess, the to sum up uh, all the things that I shared and what uh, I feel could make a contribution for other people. Yeah, and just to add to that, guys, it's all about just reaching out. You know, mm -hmm. you have a voice. Don't think you don't, you know. Uh, there's people like Rhea, there's people like me, you know. There's so many avenues that you can actually reach out to. So I'm glad that Rhea mentioned all that. Um, you know, there is help, guys. You're not alone, okay? Mm -hmm. So, um, like, again, like I said, if you want to reach out to Rhea, um, you can reach her in her. Uh, social media handles and I'll make sure that it is on the caption on this interview and you can just easily click to her handle or even just uh, private message us and I'll be able to connect you guys so that the, the right help or the right um, discussion uh, with the right person. So again, Ria, thank you so much for your time. I know we can talk on and on and on and have so much more. <laughs> up on but um i appreciate you and for sure i'll, I'll invite you again um maybe you can talk about a specific topic or something mm -hmm. that you want to uh share again if you have any upcoming um events or maybe webinars so let's talk about that sure. but with that, guys, um, again i want to say thank you to everyone who's been tuned in this past almost six months um, we're still going to continue this uh, up to the end of, of 2020 and for sure 20, 2021. And like I said, and I claimed in my post that we will have at least 
a total of 500 inspiring people for you to, to watch and, and listen to on Spotify. Um, on Kumu, thank you guys for tuning in and for the support from the Kumu management. Um, I hope that you enjoyed that and, uh, be, and was inspired by Ria. So with that, as I always say, actions speak louder than words. And thank you for tuning in in this episode of In Love With Me. Thank you, Thank Ria. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for watching In Love With Me series.